In my first film about the brutal long tail of COVID, I asked, what's going on? What is the virus doing to the body? And more recently, another question has come to prominence. Why are so many people who've had symptoms testing negative for antibodies? Well, I've got some data on that, and it's pretty surprising. Let's dive in. Anecdotally, we're seeing a lot of people testing negative for antibodies after experiencing symptoms compatible with a COVID infection. And I know of as yet unpublished studies at London teaching hospitals that are showing a surprisingly low proportion of staff testing positive for antibodies. And this is surprising because if you were working at a London hospital in March, good luck dodging the virus. And it's even a Google suggestion, which means lots of people everywhere are experiencing it and Googling in search of an answer. This is scary, right? Because if you've not got antibodies, what's to stop you catching the virus again? What's to stop us all riding a wretched coronavirus merry-go-round forever? And it's pretty much a bolt in the head for herd immunity too. But hold your horses. I don't know how I missed it, but this brilliant Forbes article was published on May the 27th, written by William Hasseltine, an extremely well-recognized ex-prof at Harvard Medical School. Google him, legit OG. Anyway, he discusses the way the body reacts to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Essentially, upon infection, there are two major immune responses the body typically has. An antibody response, also known as a lymphoid response, and a cell-mediated response, also known as a myeloid response. What is this myeloid response? Well, myeloid cells attack the virus and the infected cells directly. Some myeloid cells engulf and destroy virus particles, others kill the infected cells directly, and others still induce a protective inflammatory response by release of compounds called cytokines. Remember where we've talked about an inflammatory response and cytokines before? Yep, post-viral fatigue. So what is it that the SARS-2 virus is doing differently than other coronaviruses to have this effect? The way SARS-2 affects both arms of the immune response is different. The lymphoid pathway is muted and the myeloid pathway hyperactive. This helps explain why some people who recover from COVID-19 have very low, sometimes undetectable levels of anti-SARS-2 antibodies. The consequential hyperactive myeloid response, on the other hand, can result in the famous cytokine storm associated with the rapid decline and death of COVID-19 patients. In dampening the antibody response to infection and ramping up production of chemokines, SARS-2 is amplifying what happens to us naturally as our immune systems age. In other words, infection by SARS-2 tips the balance of a misregulated immune system still further, explaining what we know all too well. Older people are at far higher risk of serious disease and dying from COVID-19 than the young. But while this hyperactive myeloid response might be deadly in the old, it's certainly having a profound effect in the young too. My feeling is that this is what we're seeing with the people out there, the one in 10 still suffering brutal fatigue well after a COVID infection and potentially the long tail of symptoms too. All seems to kind of make sense, right? But science needs more than just sense, it needs evidence. So let's take a look. Researchers at the Rockefeller University in New York looked at blood plasma samples from 149 patients. They discovered that most people who recover from a COVID infection generate a weak antibody response to SARS-2. Whilst patients' immune systems could generate the antibodies, they didn't necessarily make enough of them to neutralize the virus. In fact, the neutralizing effect was undetectable in 33% of the sample. So clearly, this battle against a SARS-2 infection is not being won entirely with a lymphoid or antibody response. And let's look at the accuracy of the two primary antibody tests being done in the UK, the Abbott test and the Roche test. We'll ignore the manufacturer's figures and instead look at Public Health England's independent tests. Here's the Abbott test. The specificity is very high, essentially 100%. This means that the risk of false positive is negligible i.e. you can trust a positive result. But the sensitivity, not so much, 93%. This means that there is a significant risk of false negative, i.e. if your test comes back negative, that doesn't necessarily mean you've got no antibodies. And we can see here how that figure drops with time. For people who caught COVID in early mid-March, extrapolation would suggest you'd be looking at a 75 to 80% figure here for a negative result. And here's the Roche test, also very good at positive results, a high specificity. But not so much the negative ones. Overall, 15 of the 93 samples tested incorrectly negative. 
Interestingly though, in contrast to the Abbott test, the sensitivity increases as the interval increases. That is to say, if it's been a while since you had an infection, this data suggests you should go for the Roche test, not the Abbott one. What do these results tell us? Well, to understand, let's look at the way the tests are calibrated in the first place. The calibration of tests is done with the very sick in hospitals, potentially creating spectrum bias. And there have been studies done to investigate this. That means that the level of tolerance in these tests may not be set in the right place for those with more mild conditions, especially if those tests are done several weeks after the initial infection when antibody levels are starting to decline. Here's a graph of how the IgG antibody level declines over time. In some of these people, it may be declining under the test threshold that's been set too high due to the initial calibration using extremely sick patients. Here's what I think is going on. This is a novel coronavirus, and novel is certainly the right word. It seemingly attacks organs at will, lungs in some people, hearts in others, pretty much whatever it wants. So it's not unreasonable to assume that given the different ways that the virus attacks the body, there may also be a spread in terms of how individuals respond to the virus. Whilst in any immune response there will always be some combination of the two, some people may have a heavier antibody response, whilst others may have a heavier myeloid or cell-mediated response. My theory is this. Those that have a heavier myeloid response are both more likely to a. Test negative for antibodies, especially after a longer period of time, and B. Suffer from post-viral fatigue. Now, data to test this is somewhat harder to come by, so I conducted my own research. Uh, using both the UK and US COVID long hauler Facebook groups, numbering many thousands of people. Now, of course, there are some caveats to this kind of data. Uh, the sample is both self-selecting and self-reporting, and there is no shortage of intrinsic biases and so on. But as the Body Politic group found in their survey, there was no statistical difference between those who were tested negative and positive for COVID in terms of which symptoms were reported i.e. symptoms are a far more reliable indicator of infection than a swab. Pre-test probability also backs this up. And all of this group of long haulers were experiencing symptoms. Now, there were 95 people in my sample. Uh, the average interval for an antibody test was about 10 weeks after infection. The results from the Roche test would predict 100% uh, accuracy after this time interval. The Abbott test uh, with extrapolation uh, would suggest around 80. <clears throat> so let's split the difference and call it 90%. Out of our 95 sample then, that should mean we'd expect to see 85 positive antibody tests. But if long haulers have a propensity towards a cell-mediated or myeloid response rather than a lymphoid or antibody response, then this number could be lower. It's a bit like family fortunes, this. You said 85, our survey said 21. That's right, only 21 of the 95 long haulers tested above the detection threshold for antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. That's 22%, not 90% or even 80%. The remainder, 74, of course, were negative for antibodies. Breaking it down, 14 of the 95 had had a positive swab for COVID. 81 had either not been tested or tested negative. Interestingly, a positive swab is no guarantee of a positive antibody test, as you can see here. As many testing negative for antibodies as positive. One small side note here, these particular positive antibody tests tended to have happened at a much sooner interval than the unswabbed or negative swabbed, i.e. less far into the infection. And this may account for some of the higher positive ratio. Most of the sample found it very difficult or impossible to get hold of a swab at the time of infection, which for most of them was early to mid-March. And this is of course consistent with the number of tests available and the testing criteria in both the US and the UK at the time. Some of them did go on then to have a test in weeks 7, 8, 9 or 10, uh, which came back negative, and this of course is entirely consistent with what we know about that positive testing window uh, with the swab, which usually is 7 to 10 days after infection. And as for the brands of tests themselves, sample size is too small really to draw any major conclusions, but there's nothing here to suggest Roche is super sensitive to long-tail infections or late interval tests. Does this support the theory that the immune response to COVID in this group of long haulers is primarily cell-mediated rather than antibody-led? Well, I'd say so. 
Let's look at some more data hot off the press. This is a study of 200 frontline healthcare workers at University College Hospital in London. This data was collected much earlier than most of the antibody tests taken in my sample, so unsurprisingly it shows a higher proportion of positive antibody tests. In total, 45.3% of the staff in the sample eventually tested positive for antibodies. But let's quickly pick up on some other interesting findings. Only 21% tested positive for SARS-2 via swab in this period. Now, of course, some may have already had it, but when your positive swab rate is half the antibody rate, it tells you something about how reliable those swabs are. Not very. Uh, that's reflected in my data too. And only 19% of those who tested positive on a swab met the government's definitions of symptoms. And what does that tell us about the symptoms the government told us were COVID and that nothing else qualified for a test? Well, you can work that out for yourselves. So let's just recap on where we're up to. I'm proposing that there are three categories of people who contract COVID and the ways that they respond to the virus are different. So let's call them long haulers, fast clearers, uh, those who basically have symptoms for a week or two and then get better, and asymptomatic. And I'm proposing that long haulers may have a different immune response that may be partly responsible for some of this long hauling. That is to say, a more significant myeloid response and a less significant lymphoid or antibody response. How am I proposing to show this? Well, via the results of antibody tests and the proportion testing positive in each group. So, 22% of our long haulers are testing positive for antibodies. What about the staff at UCLH? Well, again, I'm going to assume that symptoms are the most accurate indicator of infection uh, compared to the number of false negatives we see with swabs. So, of those reporting symptoms at UCLH, 24 of 45 tested positive for antibodies. That's 53%. Now, asymptomatic is a bit more complicated. Some of this group will currently have COVID, some may have previously had COVID, and some won't have had COVID at all at the point that this survey was taken. 27 of the 155, or 17%, swabbed positive. But 37% of them had antibodies. So it stands to reason that at least 37% of them have had COVID. But we don't know what proportion of that 155 actually did have COVID. So the number for asymptomatic is a minimum of 37%. If you assume that half of the total asymptomatics had had COVID and half had not, the percentage showing antibodies would be 74%. However you look at this number, even the minimum is significantly higher than our long haulers. So, let's look at our three categories. Long haulers, 22%. Fast clearers, 53%. And asymptomatic, assuming that half of the 155 were infected, 74%. Now we don't know if there are some long haulers hiding in the fast clearers data, but according to King's College London, long haulers only number about 1 in 10 of those who have symptoms, uh, and even if they were in there, they'd only serve to drag this number downwards if my theory is correct. It's kind of interesting, huh? But it does, of course, raise more questions. What does a negative antibody test mean regarding possible immunity and reinfection? That's a bit harder to answer right now. William Goldman, the famous novelist and screenwriter, once said of the movie business, nobody knows anything. And the same could almost be said of the current understanding of what COVID does to the body. All we can really do is to trawl the data as we get it and try and learn what we can. Now, I doubt my study is going to make The Lancet or BMJ, but I think it certainly deserves further investigation. I'd love to see a larger, cleaner data set, especially when it comes to the category of positive swabs. Not that that particularly affects my opinion over whether someone's had COVID or not, but it makes the data harder to argue with. Perhaps as we start to see more studies getting published, we'll find that data out there. There's also no distinction in my study between those who've had ongoing viral symptoms and those who are suffering something closer to post-viral fatigue. Post-viral fatigue has previously been connected to this hyperactive immune response or cytokine storm, so that makes sense. But what's going on with these mad, ongoing, more viral type symptoms? Is the virus still active in the body or is the body maybe reacting to damage caused by the virus? We just don't know at least the condition is starting to get a little bit more attention. Here's Professor Williams from King's College London. 
It may be that people having this overactive inflammatory response are also at greater risk at getting viral fatigue with COVID, and that's one of the things we're going to look at. Chronic fatigue is overlooked in general medical training, although a new online training module has been devised recently. Doctors have traditionally been very poor at dealing with this. Now it's more important than ever that they are educated about it. I think we'd all agree about that. So for now, all we can really do is look after ourselves, but I hope it's slightly reassuring when a clearer picture starts to emerge. It's just a question of waiting for the data. Until then, if you've got any antibody test result stories you'd like to share, then let's start a discussion in the comments and perhaps we can start to get a slightly fuller picture. Till next time.